I'm just trying to. Thank you, Paul, uh, very much for the warm welcome. And uh, it is indeed a pleasure to uh, speak for the uh, Leeds Theolo Theosophical Society. And uh, my topic today uh, is on Nakshatra Gandanta. And I will be speaking on Nakshatra Sandhi tomorrow. So it's actually uh, two parts of the same topic where we are going to be discussing certain sensitive uh, junctures or points uh, of nakshatras that they have with each other. So before I do, uh, I just want to take the name of the guru. And I would also like to uh, chant the Mrityunjay Mantra once because of the sensitivity of the topic. Gandanta causes us uh, discomforts and troubles and problems. So the Mrityunjay Mantra once would do us all good. Om Bhagavate Namah Om Bhagavate Namah Om Bhagavate Namah Om Trayambakam Yajamahe Sugandhim pushti vardhanam urvaru kami vabandhanan mrityur mushti mukshi yamamrita. Okay, the topic today we have is Nakshatra Gandanta. And we are going to start today by trying to identify what are the different definitions or meanings of the word Gandanta. The ancient seers and the rishis from Vashishta, Saunaka, Parashara, uh, they have said that, you know, Gandanta exists not only between nakshatras, but Gandanta exists between tithis, uh, it exists between rashis, it exists between bhavas. But we are largely going to now discuss the various kind of uh, issues of Gandanta and Sandhis and junctures which nakshatras have with each other. Now, the first definition of Gandanta, or rather of Ganda, means that it is a cheek. And when we say cheek, uh, you know, in common parlance, people tend to think that cheek only means, you know, these two puffy areas of our face, but that is actually not so, both by uh, definition of uh, Western uh, anatomy and uh, according to traditional definitions as well. Cheek consists of the entire side of your face, right from your jaw and then going up to the temples or the sideburns here, but below the eyes, it doesn't include the eyes, you know, it's this entire part right up here. Now, when we want to, uh, you know, from the Rashi chart, uh, the second house indicates the full face. But if we want to identify the parts of the face, you know, how do we say, well, the eyes are affected or the nose is affected or the cheeks are affected. Then in such case, we turn to the scheme provided by the Dreshkana. So this Dreshkana scheme of body parts, we have actually the body parts divided according to the first Dreshkana and the second Dreshkana and the third Dreshkana. So here in the first Dreshkana, we have the entire head, which includes the face. So the face is divided into nine parts, all right? The face is divided into nine parts in the first Dreshkana, in the Dreshkana scheme of body parts. And in this, you know, our focus comes to the eighth house. So the eighth house and the ninth house are the jaws and the temple. So the entire cheek, starting from the jaws right up to the temple, is covered by the eighth house and the ninth house. So if you precisely say, where does the cheek fall? We'd actually say it is the eighth house, with the ninth house being the sideburn up to the temple. Now, the eighth house is actually the 22nd Dreshkana. And this 22nd Dreshkana maps into the fourth house of the Navamsha chart. Now the eighth house of the Navam of the Rashi, when you're doing the Navamsha calculation, then the 64th Navamsha, which again is the eighth house, maps into the fourth house of the Navamsha. So both eighth houses, all right? maps into the fourth house of Navamsha chart. One is the 22nd Rishkana and the other is the 64th Navamsha. It depends on the way we are dividing up the horoscope. 
And this fourth house in the Navamsha chart is called the Kharasthana. Khara is the name of an infamous uh, demon. And he was a man-eating carnivore. He was related to the great uh, Ravana. And he was really wicked and created a lot of problems for everybody. But, but his salient feature was that he was a very deadly man-eating Rakshasa or demon. So this place is called Kharasthana. So any grahas or planets which are in the fourth house of Navamsha are called Khara or Khara grahas. And the lord of that house is called Kharesha. Okay. Of course, uh, you know, the other rishis have expounded further that it is not only from the fourth house from uh, Navamsha uh, Lagna, but we can see fourth house from the Karakamsha. We can also see fourth house from the uh, Rashi Lagna, etc. So fourth house from various uh, Swamsa points, various points which define the self is actually called Khara Sthana or Khara Bhava, but ideally we call it that. So this whole eight house, which is the chi, is mapping into this infamous Khara Bhava or Khara Sthana, which means that immediately this is a danger zone. Drishkana is saying that the word Ganda, which means the cheek, is a danger zone. Okay, so this is a first level definition. Now, second level definition, which is uh, not easily available, it means that Ganda is something which is very rough and abrasive. And that which is rough and abrasive can cut and harm the body, like with a knife, like with a cutting thing. And what does it cut and how does it harm? It basically cuts against the skin and other tender protective parts of the body. They are very easily cut by these rough points. So remember the, uh, the word rough. We also can see the picture of an animal here, which in English you call the rhinoceros. And in Sanskrit, this animal is called a gandaka. Gandaka is somebody who's disjointed. If you see a rhinoceros's body, a rhinoceros's body is actually very, very disjointed, if you can see right here. You know, he has these bits of fleshes uh, poking in from all angles. So a gandaka is also something which is disjointed. The disjoint may have happened because of cutting, okay? Because of abrasion, because of certain roughness. So we have already got two definitions, which are a not very happy definition. One which is leading us from the definition of a cheek, a very a benign definition, leading us to a kara kind of a meaning, a kara meaning, which is like a very deadly, somebody who can eat you up, and secondly, we are talking about roughness or abrasiveness that can cut you up, that can cause you harm. There is a third meaning to Ganda, which means that it is a joint, a joint of any kind. All right. I would be taking uh, this point up more tomorrow when I discuss the more fuller meaning of junctions. But today I'm going to restrict myself uh, to the word Gandanta because Gandanta and Sandhi are two points. Uh, by which we are actually talking about junctures or junction points between two things. Since our theme is nakshatra, I will be focusing on the junction points between nakshatras. But today, of course, those junction points, which are known as gandanta, all right? So uh, tomorrow we'll go into the larger definition that how this gandanta comes under the notion of junctures. So junctures are basically... Um, very sensitive points, okay? Any join, you know, like when you have a furniture and a piece of furniture, you will see that there are points where there is a join. The joints are always the weak points. The joints are points which can be cracked open, which get broken easily, okay? So ganda also means joints, the sensitive points, which is vulnerable to uh, breakage, which is vulnerable to any kind of severance just like the human body. The reason I talked about the human body is because in the human body, you know that the joints are very, very vulnerable. And as we usually get on with age, we uh, develop things like arthritis over there. The joints begin to get stiff and pain, whether it's the joints between your hand and wrist, the joint between your shoulder and neck, or neck and head, or joint between your knees. Uh, we are all very familiar with this. 
and because they are very, very weak, they are joining two pieces together. So they are a vulnerable point. And because of that, they are prone to breakage. Now, there is another part of the word. As we said, that Ganda has uh, many parts to its definition. But we also have, have the word called Anta. What does Anta mean? Anta, in a very literal sense, means the end or the completion or the end of one's life or death. And hence, because it also means death, uh, Antaka is a name for the god of death or Yama. So Antaka is another name of Yama. So that is the one who comes in the end to take us, okay? Now, when we add these two uh, parts together, when we add Ganda and Anta together, we get the word Gandanta. Hence, Gandanta shows us a time, all right? A point, <coughs> excuse me, in the zodiac, okay? It is a point in the zodiac where things end very abruptly very roughly, very suddenly. And sometimes it can cause long-term transformation, but this usually causes a very major transformation in our lives. These points cause major transformation in our lives. And usually these transformations can occur suddenly. Though in some cases, it can happen gradually over a period of time. So since we associated the concept of khara with Gandanta. We associated uh, the concept of anything that is rough and abrasive with Gandanta. Since we associated the concept of weak points or junctions where Gandanta is concerned. That means these points in the zodiac are not happy points. These points are points which are going to cause us trouble, right? It can even cause death or it can cause us death-like conditions. It can cause us death-like situations. It can cause us a lot of trouble. Sometimes when moon is in these, uh, in these Gandantam points, moon can completely erode lineages away. Entire patrilineal lineage or entire matrilineal lineage. They can simply get obliterated if Chandra happens to be present. And you know, when Chandra is present, it can even cause an effect on the life. But we are talking about presence of any graha. Because if this is a point that we are talking about, then any graha in this point is going to cause problems for us, right? The end becomes so rough that it can change us in a drastic manner. Hence, I said that usually it ends things abruptly and causing a major transformation in our life. So there are three such very rough junctions in the zodiac, okay? There are many other Gandanta points, all right? But the three major, the three rough junctions in the zodiac is what we really, or the rishis have also given us the definition are what is known as Gandanta. Now let us examine what these rough points are. Now, the first thing that we must remember about these rough points is that these are all fire and water junctions, okay? Now, what happens when a fire and water come together? You may ask that water has the capacity to douse fire, but many times water is unable to douse fire. It doesn't happen all the time that water is able to douse it. For example, when we have these raging forest fires, in Sanskrit, they are called davagni, okay? Now, an example of a raging forest fire would be what has been going on in California in the last few years. Last year itself, we had the very famous Dixie fire. I've given you a photograph of the Dixie fire. And you can see over here that the, uh, the two uh, firefighters are standing over here, unable to control anything. During the Dixie fire, they actually took a helicopter on the top and they tried to spray water, but that did not help. Okay, and it burned, as you can see over here, 963, almost 964 hectares, and it was supposed to be the largest single wildfire which was recorded in Californian history. But this is not the only one. They've been having fires like these regularly. They are so severe. They are so damaging that they have destroyed town after town, small town. They've destroyed community after community and they rage after months before they can be contained. It takes at least three to four months to contain them. So 
here water is not able to douse the fire out. Okay, so we are talking about what can happen. It's a very, very severe junction point. Then from the ancient scriptures, we have the story from Mahabharata. In the Mahabharata, we have the story of the Lakshagriha. Lakshagriha, Laksha means lacquer or lac. And there's this kind of false palace made of lacquer that was uh, constructed by the Kauravas, where they invited the Pandava brothers and their wives. And their whole aim was to, you know, light that palace up and uh, kill them. But of course, you know, uh, they actually get to know about this plan, plot, and they escape from the place. But Agni Deva required an uh, offering from them. They said, you have to burn the entire very large forest called the Khandava forest. That is a remedy. You have to offer this to me. If you don't offer this to me, then I shall engulf you. So they had to burn this forest called Khandava forest in order to escape their life from being burnt into the Lakshagriha. And this forest fire is called the Davagni, as I told you. So this story about the Vagni of forest fires, which rage on and destroy everybody, uh, it was there right from our scriptures. Now, the next thing that we must remember over here, that when we are talking about the fire and water junctures, which is actually fire and water rashis that are coming over here, so we are taking a Pisces Aries junction, and then we are taking a Cancer Leo junction, and we are taking a Scorpio Sagittarius junction. These are the three fire water junctions that we are taking. Okay, now you will see that the nakshatras which are involved in the end of both these signs, these nakshatras are ruled by Mercury and Ketu. So you will see that the Jalarashi, the last nakshatra of the Jalarashi happens to be Revati in Meenarashi, Aslesha in Karka and Jeshtha in Scorpio. The last nakshatra of the Jalarashis and these three nakshatras are all ruled by Mercury. This is the second point that I wish you all to remember. One was the fire water junction, the Agni Jala junction between the Rashis and here we are saying that the last nakshatra of the Jalarashis are all ruled by Mercury. And then we are going to look at the first nakshatras of the adjoining Agni Rashis and we are looking at Mesha, Simha and Dhanu. And the last, the first nakshatras of here are Ashwini, Magha and Mula. So Ashwini is the first nakshatra of Mesha Rashi, Magha is the first nakshatra of Simha Rashi and Mula is the first nakshatra of Dhanu Rashi. And all these three Rashis are Agni Rashi and all these three nakshatras are ruled by Ketu. And the all three last nakshatras of the Jalarashi, Revati, Astesha, and Jeshta, the last nakshatras of Meena, Karka, and Vishtika, they are all ruled by Mercury. So this is the second thing that you are learning. Not just that it's a junction between fire and water, Agni and Jala, but there is some kind of a yoga with Mercury Ketu. Is it a yoga or is it some kind of a clash that is happening between Mercury and Ketu over here? So Mercury and Ketu is playing a very significant role. And this is what we are going to focus on, uh, you know, a bit today. So, you know, uh, uh, Rishi Jaimini has, Maharshi Jaimini has taught us that Mercury Ketu forms a yoga for the breakage of bones. Okay. And uh, because Mercury is actually all Prithvi Tattva, the Rajas Gunagraha, and only Ketu has the capacity to destroy the Rajas Gunagraha. Uh, so Mercury Ketu is actually a breakage of bones yoga. So Mercury and Ketu is not a great yoga. And we can see that that yoga is that these two grahas are so important that they are signifying the activation of the Gandanta points of the zodiac. Okay. They are signifying the Gandan, Gandanta points of the zodiac. And the, this is triggered by the, the Gandanta points are triggered by the Mercury nakshatras. Whereas the Ketu nakshatras are actually showing the rebuilding after the damage. So if Mercury is showing an earthquake or a tsunami or any kind of natural disaster, Ketu is going to show the rebuilding of homes. All right. This is how they are countering each other. So we have this set of six nakshatras at the juncture between the Agni and Jalarashis. 
And the significant point is that planets placed in the six nakshatras will Shogandanta experiences in life. This is the most important point because uh, we will look into the actual degrees, which are the deep Gandanta points. Parashara has given us those degrees. We will look into that. And we also know that Chandra, the moon, plays a very important role because moon rules longevity and life and health. And that is why most astrologers actually only take moon placement in these areas. But we actually have to see the placement of any graha in these points will actually yield those results. So we are going a step further and we are saying that it's not just those uh, actual degree of the Gandanta nakshatras, but we are saying any graha placed in any of the six nakshatras itself is problematic. So if we have uh, grahas in either of these six nakshatras, the placement itself is problematic. And how much of problem you will get, that depends on the degrees and the lordships and exact point of Gandanta, which is there. And this is precisely what we are going to examine today. Now, when I said that if we are taking the conjunctions between fire and Jalarashi, that we took Pisces Aries and we took Cancer Leo and we took Scorpio uh, Sagittarius. So you can see that this actually forms the trine of the zodiac, isn't it? That Mesha is the first house and Simha is the fifth house and Dhanu is the ninth house. So it exactly divides them into 120 degrees. So do we have a lesson here? All right. These junctures are very, very uh, life affecting junctures because if the ninth house is my past because it denotes my father so it's my past and then the lagna being the fifth house from the nine that is a child of my father which is me that is the present and then my child is fifth from me that is my fifth house okay that is the fifth house so ninth house first house, fifth house, and we have the three generations that my father, myself, and my child. So we are talking about generation points here where the zodiac is concerned. Okay, uh, movements, that's why movements from uh, one point to the other point, a ninth house jumps are known as Simhavalokanagati. That is, if there's a movement when you're can counting the Shasti from the ninth house to the fifth, it is a very, very major jump. It is a very major gati which impacts our life. So you see, when we are talking about these three rashis, okay, or uh, these pairs of ra rashis, this is actually in a very uh, significant uh, points of the natural zodiac of the Kalpurusha, the first, fifth, and the ninth, the past, present, and the future. Okay, and it is said that we actually enter through the ninth house. The Navamsha horoscope came before us. Uh, we were born through the Navamsha, and that is the division of the ninth house. So you can see that the root begins from the ninth house itself. So all the more, we are adding more layers and understanding why these points are so problematic. Okay, the three points of the zodiac, the juncture between fire and water, because once this uh, uh, clash between Agni and Jala uh, starts, it's very, very difficult to douse them. And then we got the most interesting point from here that these nakshatras are Mercury nakshatras and Ketu nakshatras. Okay, now let's move a little more ahead. So, nakshatra gandantas are related to Vayu and Prana, though the Rashi points, when we talked about ja Agni and Jala, these are the Rashi junctions, correct? Meena, Mesha, Karka, Simha, Vrishika, Dhanu, the other Agni and Jala Rashi. But Nakshatra, Nakshatra Gandanta, that is when we are talking about the Mercury Ketu, which are placed in these Rashi Gandantas, we are directly talking about Vayu and Prana. And when we are talking about Vayu and Prana, we are talking about longevity itself, health itself. So when we are saying longevity doesn't mean that every time somebody dies in our lives. Either I die or somebody dies for me to, uh, you know, experience these troubles. But it can be death-like suffering. 
we go through experiences which are death-like. So now the lordship of the nakshatras are critical. We have already covered it, that the Gandanta nakshatras are ruled by Mercury and Ketu. So what we need to do is we need to check the placement of Mercury and Ketu. So when we are going to examine some horoscopes later on, we have to ensure that where, if there is a graha in these points, where is the placement of Mercury and Ketu? How are Mercury and Ketu? And if this Mercury and Ketu are very badly placed, so this is the uh, most uh, important point that we are talking about, that if Mercury and Ketu are badly placed, then there is a danger to life and health. All right. So we look at that. We look at the placement of this. Also, sometimes the Vimshotari Dasha, that is, if you have Grahas uh, in these uh, Gandanta Nakshatras, then uh, towards the end of Mercury or Ketu Dasha, you can also experience it. Of course, you will see in the horoscope, people have experience in other dashas, but you should be well aware that to take extra care, if you have grahas in these nakshatras, that towards the end of Mercury and Ketu Dasha, you should take extra care. Maybe do your mrittunjaya, do remedies to ensure that uh, things are fine with you. Now, uh, also, we are looking at the Bhavalots, Lordship of the Nakshatras, and we will also look at the Bhavalots, the Lords of the Houses, which these Grahas uh, affect. For example, if a Graha rules, say, a third Lord, okay, that means, uh, you know, we can lose a sim um, sibling. If a Bhava who is in any of these, a Graha who is in any of these six Nakshatras, if they are a fifth Lord, then we may lose a child, okay? So that Lordship, of the graha who is placed in these Gandanta nakshatra becomes very important. Okay. Now here you can see, <clears throat> this is what Parashara has given us when he's talked about uh, Gandanta, where he has said that from the last two ghatis of Revati to the first two ghatis of Ashwini, last two ghatis of Aslesha to the first two ghatis of Magha, from the last two ghatis of Jeshta to the first two ghatis of Mula, that these are points. All right. And as I told you earlier, that astrologers tend to only consider Chandra in these points. All right. Because the focus is on life, health and longevity. But what we are trying to say that any graha on these points are problematic. Okay. Any graha, because they are going to go through the uh, turmoil, through the upheaval. All right, through the roller coaster, through the dangers which these points in zodiac uh, provides. So any graha over there, Chandra over there, as I said, longevity and health. But any graha over here, so which actually means from twelve degree fifty three of Revati to zero degree twenty seven of Ashwini. That is of same with Asdesha, Magha, Jeshta, and Mula. We can extend this to say actually almost the last pada of Revati. Aslesha and Jeshta and the entire first pada of Ashwini, Magha and Mula are afflicted. Okay, so please note this very, very carefully. I will try to repeat this again tomorrow, but the important point is the exact uh, period, the exact points which is given by Parashara is this, that's on the 13th degree, that 12 degrees 53 of Revati to 0 degree 27 minutes of Ashwini, 12 degrees 53 of Aslesha to 0 degrees 27 minutes of Magha, 12 degrees 53 minutes of Jeshta to 0 degrees 27 minutes of Mula. But we are actually saying that the entire last pada of Revati, Aslesha, Jeshta and the entire first pada of Ashwini, Magha and Mula are vulnerable. And the second thing that we are saying is that it is not only Chandra here, but any Graha over here is going to be problematic. And then we are saying one step further that it is not only these degrees, not only just these Padas, but any Graha placed in these Nakshatras itself is going to give us some trouble. That is what Gandanta is. This Nakshatra itself is Gandanta. Right? And so... From that Gandanta Nakshatra, we are kind of, you know, fine tuning the degrees to, you know, narrow it down, narrow it down, narrow it down further and further. Okay. So we are saying, A, yes, the end, not only are these specific Gandanta degrees, 
but maybe the entire last and first pada, that is the last pada of the nakshatras and Jalarashi and first pada of the nakshatras and Agnirashi, that itself is problematic, then we are saying further that the nakshatras itself are problematic. And the case studies I'm going to show to you is actually looking at all grahas which are in these six nakshatras, which is reflecting to you not only the fire-water conjunction of the Rashis, but also the problem between Mercury and Ketu. Okay, are you uh, with me uh, on all this? Now, I would just simply touch upon the Jeshta Mula Gandanta here, and I would like to uh, mention to you uh, Chandra's placement uh, in these nakshatras, and specifically in the different padas of these nakshatras. I had covered this last year uh, in a a webinar in a masterclass for the uh, Raman and Rajeshwari Research Foundation. And I think that is freely available on YouTube. So I do not wish to duplicate that here. So if you want to go further in detail about what happens to moon in these kind of Gandanta points and to different others of the Gandanta point, then I would uh, recommend you to uh, listen to uh, that lecture. So uh, so I'm not going to replicate that part. So we're going to talk about other points, other very important points of Gandanta, Nakshatra Gandanta, which is overlooked. Now, Parashara has given a little bit of further input, and he has said that the Jeshta Mula Gandanta is the worst of all the three Gandanta spans. And as we have already found out that the Jeshta Mula, Mula Gandanta, is right there in the ninth house, right? The ninth house from which is our carrier, of our uh, prarabdha karma, right? The ninth lord is the carrier of our prarabdha karma. The ninth house depicts our prarabdha karma. And it is because of due to that prarabdha karma do we take this manusha janma or we are born. And in Avamsha Chata, Avamsha Lagna actually uh, vilify, verifies that. So the Mula Gandanta is very important. The word Mula means root. That means these are karmic issues which are very deep rooted, which has which goes back into our prarabdha. So grahas in Mula Gandanta are carrying the baggage or weightage of prarabdha karma issues for us. And uh, Parashara has hence, you know, expanded the span, even through his very precise definition, has expanded the span of this nakshatra. And he has included not just two ghatis, but he's included the last six ghatis of Jeshta and the first eight ghatis of Mula. All right. So, though, so you can see now when we have uh, calculated this part in, uh, the degree at uh, uh, sort of parameters for the Jeshta Mula changes. So we have it from 12 degrees of Jeshta to one degree, 47 minutes of Mula. This entire part uh, is actually problematic. And again, would like to draw your attention. People discuss only Chandra here. They will speak about if you are born with a moon in Mula, they will say, oh, there is gan uh, Mula Ganda Dosha. We should do Mula Ganda Puja correctly because when moon is there, our longevity is threatened, right? Life and longevity is threatened. But, but the, uh, uh, the uh, thing that we have over here is that it is not just Chandra. It's very interesting the Nimitta, you know, suddenly say the battery is running low. So it is not just Chandra. People only, or pundits, when you go to any astrologer pundit, including ourselves, when we see a, a client has come to us with moon in these points, we immediately tell them, please go and do a Mula, Mula Gandanta Puja because your life is at danger. But what I'm trying to say, it's not just Chandra. We focus on, or rather pundits, focus on Chandra because it impacts your life and longevity. But any graha out here is a problem, right? Any grahas in this Mula Gandanta will rake up and cause you problem, okay? With layers and layers of part, part of the history out here, okay? So I have already uh, mentioned this point to you that the entire last pada of Revati, Aslesha, and Jeshta, and the entire first pada of Ashwini, Magha, and Mulal troublesome areas, though less than these Gandanta points. And furthermore, the entirely these six nakshatras are problematic. So 
So we have already covered this, that astrologers only see the moon in these places, nakshatras as they fear death. Bhava lords in Gandhata can show sudden uh, demises or changes in people's or events related to, the, to these houses. So as I mentioned earlier, that if the third lord is in a Gandhanta nakshatra, it can show the death of a sibling or a sibling who's going through a lot of problem. If the 10th lord is in Gandhanta, it can show the end of someone's career or maybe a very drastic change in career that an entire career ends and then there is a sudden tragic occurrence, a death or something happens by which you are enforced. The word is enforced. You are enforced into a different profession altogether. Okay, so uh, the it's not just a, a fancy choice, a change in profession, which many people have, but most of the time you may be enforced into a change of profession because of a death that may have occurred. Okay. So we are now going to look at uh, some of these uh, horoscopes. And I'm going to start with the horoscope of uh, Mohandas Karamchad Gandhi, better known as Mahatma Gandhi. And uh, many times we see, you know, uh, horoscopes where there may be, uh, you know, several planets in these six nakshatras. And right now we are just now going to look at grahas in these six nakshatras. And you will see that then, you know, when you identify the degrees, you can see some are creating more problem than the others. but Check the lordship of all those nakshatras and you will see that uh, the bhava lordship and you will see that there is a problem in that area of life. Now, Mahatma Gandhi uh, was actually quite a very good uh, scholar and he was sent from India to UK, to London, to study law at the University College of London. And he studied uh, law at the University College of London for three years. And then he was invited to the bar at the Inner Temple. And so he went to the bar at the Inner Temple. And after a few years of uh, study and practice at the bar, he was invited to join the bar. He uh, returned to India very briefly. He left UK and came to India because his mother, I think, had passed away. So he was in India and he tried to work in India and things didn't work out over here. So he sailed ship to South Africa. And he remained in South Africa for 21 years. And what did he do? He was a, of course, he was a trained barrister. So he had a legal profession. He practiced his legal profession for 21 years in South Africa. Now, but we don't know him as such, do we? We really know him as the great statesman and the great nationalist leader and the great politician, Mahatma Gandhi. So we can see here, I've written this note out for you, that the 10th Lord and Atmakarika, many of these grahas, when they big Atmakarika, that means the karmic challenges or the karmic baggage is uh, that much more weighty or heavy. So we can see the 10th Lord and Atmakarika Chandra, which is actually in 29th degree of Karka in a Slesha Gandanta, right? 29th degree of Karka, it is right in the Gandanta point. And he experienced a sudden change in career from law to politics. So basically what happened uh, whilst he was these 21 years in South Africa, he got involved in the civil rights movement and he got involved in the civil rights movement in a very, very strong way. 1893 to 1914 was, I think, his Chandra Dasha. And in this Chandra Dasha, he really... Uh, put forward a huge challenge to the British colonial power, which was over there. For example, you know, uh, uh, being a, a brown-skinned person, he was not allowed to sit in a first-class compartment in the uh, carriage, but he would refuse to budge. You know, this is just one example. Till they would come and beat him and throw him out. Similarly, many things he was not, they were not allowed to do, but he would do, there have been occasions when he has been bitten, beaten, shoved into the gutters, thrown into the drains, thrown out of trains, but he persisted and did it. He was very, very strong inside and he did that. He united, he molded all the Indians who were there in South Africa. He, 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 formed a unified cohesion. He formed them in a group and he created the uh, NATO Congress over there. 
So his work was absolutely phenomenal. And this experiences that he had was all in Chandra Dasha. So at first glance, you would say it's fantastic. Chandra is 10th Lord in 10th house, so Shitra, uh, you know, and of course he has a Malavya Yoga in Lagna, et cetera, et cetera. But this is the, because it is in that very final 29 degree of Aslesha, he experienced all this. And you can see Rahu's also there with it. Finally, in uh, 1915, uh, he actually returned to India and he returned to India because he was invited by uh, one of the nationalist, great nationalist leaders called Gokhale, who invited because he thought, oh, what a man, look at the work he's doing, look at the way he's uh, challenging against the British colonialists. And we need somebody like that in our uh, freedom movement. So he was invited to come back to India by Gokhale. And in 1915, he returned to India. Of course, he gave up law. And you don't remember him as a lawyer at all. That's why I kind of put that photograph of him where he's in his lawyer's garb. Uh, you know him uh, as like a little fakir or a saintly figure with a little loincloth, with a little, uh, you know, uh, Angavastram or a chadar over his body with his spectacles and his walking uh, stick. You know him like that. Somebody who went through huge protestations of his nonviolence movement, though the genesis of nonviolence movement was already coming when he was there in South Africa uh, as the championer of the nonviolent movement, uh, of the passive resistant movements, his salt marches, uh, all the steps that he took, his pass as the very shrewd politician who maneuvered, who was the father figure and the mentor to our first prime minister, Jawaharlal Nehru, and to many other people over there. So we know him as that. So the huge transition that happened, and this transition happened uh, in South Africa, and the experience that he had over there in South Africa was actually quite tough by being can you imagine being beaten up, being shoved, being pushed, being thrown in the drains, thrown in the gutters? There are n number of, uh, you know, incidents, which I'm not putting up uh, because, you know, that would take a long time if I start reading it up to you. But he went through those kind of conditions to, before he actually came to India. Eventually, you know, he was also assassinated. I would show you that most of the horoscopes of statesmen that I'm going to be sharing with you today, that they were assassinated. And you can see that he was assassinated in Sun Mercury. Now, there's one little thing that we forgot to do. Remember, we have to check the placement of Mercury and Ketu. So you can see that Mercury uh, is in Digbala, which is a good thing. And you can see even in Navamsha Lagna, I mean, I'm kind of assuming this Navamsha Lagna is uh, okay. If it is okay, then uh, he Mercury is in Digbala, even in Navamsha Lagna. That's why he had so much of that Mercury gave him that directional uh, uh, sort of that disha, gave him the path or the gati to follow uh, to pursue a certain line. And you can, of course, see Malavya Mahamur, Purush Maha Yoga there, and all the other great Mahapurush Yogas that he has. He also has Srimanta Yoga, etc. But now look at Ketu. Ketu is not only in Makara, but Ketu is in the fourth house, which is a Maranakarak Sthana for Ketu. Even in Navamsha, it is in the fourth house, Maranakarak Sthana, and it is also in the Khara. So Ketu is actually, uh, is the one which has given him more problems over here. Okay. And if you, of course, want to see the Bhava Lordship of Chandra, that is a graha, which is in the uh, this Gandanta. It is the 10th Lord, and hence it is his career. So actually, he's very lucrative. He's a bar at law from the inner temple. Lucrative career for almost altogether 25 years, maybe more, of being a lawyer ended, isn't it? That whole thing went. And then he gave up everything. He gave up that wealth and everything to, uh, you know, build an ashram. And then, of course, be so famous and be well-known because Mercury actually had to show that path. He followed that path. And uh, Malavya Mahapurush Yoga uh, fructified. And, you know, he was he still is one of the most well-known and famous figures. But just see, okay, that this one graha in this nakshatra, and yes, it is in the Gandanta point as it's in the 29 degree of the sign. Now we are going to do 
uh, a set of three horoscopes uh, who are related to each other, mother and two sons, and they all die tragically, and they all have grahas uh, in these Gandanda point. So Rajiv Gandhi was one of our former uh, prime ministers uh, of India, and he ruled uh, for uh, about five plus years. And he was the first person actually who uh, thought about economic reforms, who thought about bringing in the IT industry. He was very, very uh, forward thinking uh, in that uh, uh, place. Um, I see that Paul has raised his hand. Yes, Paul, are you uh, trying to say something? Oh, I don't know. Paul has raised his head, hand over there, but... Um, He's not saying anything, so I'll simply uh, continue. Um, just give me a second. Um, uh, okay. Because, Paul, your hand was raised. So, anyway. So, uh, yes, uh, so <clears throat> can you hear me? Yes. Um, <clears throat> sorry, somebody's raised a hand. I was trying to find out what it was, and I inadvertently. Press the raised oh, hand. Oh, okay, okay. So, let me... uh, so my mistake, but I think somebody has raised a hand, but it seems to have gone. Oh, okay. So, uh, okay, thank no you. Problem. Yeah, apologies to those who are listening to the recording. So we continue to Rajiv Gandhi, and we are going to examine Rajiv Gandhi, his son, and his mother's char, all of three who were very important figures and who uh, dry, died quite tragically and has grahas in these uh, nakshatra uh, gandanta these gandanta nakshatras so here you can see his fifth lord jupiter and the lagna lord sun are in the magha gandanta now if you look at the degree you can see that jupiter is in the 13th degree and whereas the sun is more or less more towards the uh, it's in the fourth degree so it's a uh, it's beyond the first pada. It's not really in the first pada, but it's beyond that. I mean, now we know that we are looking at the whole nakshatra. So it's just beyond the first pada over there. And this one is on the 13th degree. Now, 13th degree of a nakshatra is not very good. You can say that it is not in a, uh, in a sandhi. I mean, it is not in a gandanta uh, with the next nakshatra, right? The, the gandanta is between... Magha and uh, the nakshatra before it, but uh, it still forms a juncture, which we are going to discuss tomorrow, meaning it is like a sandhi. So, uh, uh, you know, we can come back and see the chart. So 13th degree of the nakshatra is very, very problematic because these are junctures. So Magha, now fifth house is to do with power and position, and the first house is, of course, the self. So now he actually came into power and entered politics because of the death of his uh, younger brother, uh, uh, Sanjay Gandhi. So Rajiv Gandhi was the eldest son of our prime minister, Indira Gandhi. But Rajiv Gandhi was never, ever interested in politics. So he actually, after, uh, you know, he joined uh, the uh, flying club and he got trained as a pilot and he was working as a commercial airline pilot with our domestic carrier called the Indian Airlines. You can see a photograph of him in his uh, uniform. And he was not interested. He uh, married a nice Italian girl whom he met abroad, and he had two children, and he was very happy with a secluded life away from the limelight. But his younger brother, Sanjay Gandhi, was a daredevil, very flashy, very, uh, you know, that kind of a character. And he was identified as the heir apparent to his mother, Indira Gandhi, who was the prime minister of the country. Everybody thought that after Indira Gandhi, it would be Sanjay Gandhi, her younger son, who would actually, you know, take over the mantle from her. And he was very much in politics and he was criticized because he had all kinds of, you know, very uh, very, very uh, daredevil kind of ideas. But he suddenly died at the age of 36 uh, because he was uh, uh, flying, you know, he, he was a member of the flying club as well. And he was uh, flying an aircraft. And I believe he always flew aircrafts very low. He would not wear his shoes. He would just wear a flip-flop and wear just an ordinary dress. And his older brother, Rajiv Gandhi, told him many times, please don't do this thing. He would do these uh, you know, the somersault maneuvers. And he was doing that on this fatal day. He was doing these somersault maneuvers when he lost control. And uh, there was a very, very fatal uh, plane crash and he died. I believe that the uh, doctors, the surgeons required eight hours 
to stitch his body back together. This is Sanjay Gandhi. Eight hours to stitch his body back together because it was so badly mutilated and distorted. You will see his chart as well, which caused this. But it was his death. And when his death happened, naturally the, uh, the nation was a bit shaken up and uh, his mother, who was a prime minister, was shaken up. So the party members kind of pushed Rajiv Gandhi and told him, no, you must come and join because it would help your mother. That was the line which is oft quoted. So he said, okay, if it helps my mother, I would join. But he didn't resign from Indian Airlines as a pilot. And he came in as, the, uh, uh, as a parliamentarian and went on to become the president of the National Party. And after three years, after a few years, this death of his brother happened in 1980. This is a Gandanta. That Gandanta happened, that Jupiter fifth house, is to do with power and position. So that Graha is in Gandanta. It is also combusted, if I'm not mistaken. It is combusted by sun. Who is in the Lagna? Jupiter is in Big Bala, right? Fifth Lord in Digbala with Lagna Lord Surya. Very, very powerful Raja Yogas we can see over there. There is also Second Lord over there, Srimanta Yoga. Mercury, Jupiter are both in Digbala over there. It's absolutely fantastic. And Surya, Lagnesha and Swashetra. But when did these yogas fructify? Because Jupiter is there in this Gandanta in Magha Nakshatra. Magha is also the, uh, the throne, remember. Because it the Magha Nakshatra, what happened? It is only after an Gandanta experience that he got the power. And that Gandanta experience was this horrific death of his brother. It was only then that he was dragged in and he didn't want to be dragged in, but he was dragged in because his mother was in a bad way and everybody told him, you have to do it for your mother. Now, very interestingly, three to four years after that, three years after that, in 1984, his mother, the then Prime Minister, Indira Gandhi, was brutally assassinated. She was assassinated by two of her bodyguards. So now that was another Gandanta experience, okay? And uh, so, of course, he went on to become the prime minister after that, and he was the prime minister for five and a half years. But he was also, he died at a very young age. He was also very, very brutally assassinated from the Sri Lanka militants. He was so badly mutilated, they couldn't find his face. They had to take pieces of his body because a suicide bomber had come to hug him and his whole bloody body blew apart and they had to find the pieces and they had to uh, put all those pieces together. And you can see the Lagnesh itself is in the second pada of Mahanakshatra. Okay, so the Lagnesh and Fifth Lord are both in Magha because the Lagnesh is involved over there. The moon is also involved over there. In this case, we also, of course, study the degrees of the moon very, very carefully. Now it is also told us, apart from this, we must examine Mercury and Ketu. So Mercury, we can say, is, yes, part of this whole scenario. And Mercury is giving him a lot of uh, fantastic yogas, like Srimanta Yoga, is in Digbala, both Rashi and Avamsha. Look at Ketu, it is in the sixth house. All right. And uh, it, it was, he actually died in Rahu Mercury. It was, Mercury is also Marrakesh. Rahu is also Marrakesh. The seventh lord is Rahu. The second lord is both Mercury and Rahu. So in the Dasha Antar Dasha of Rahu Mercury, uh, he passed away in Janma Vimshottari calculation. Okay. Uh, now let's uh, look at another one. This is Sanjay Gandhi, his brother whom we uh, talked about. And in this horoscope of his brother, you can see that the seventh Lord Moon is in Magha Gandanta. Now this moon is also in the 13 degree in Simha, just like Rajiv Gandhi. Just like Rajiv Gandhi's chart, uh, his uh, uh, fifth Lord, Jupiter, is in this 13th degree of Magha. And look at him, his moon is in the 13th degree. Why are we looking at moon? This is when the moon is placed in this Gandanta, we always take it, take it as a threat to life and longevity, as an indication that there may be a death-like situation. You can see that it is also uh, uh, having Chandrashtama dosha, okay? And he died uh, in this uh, very brutal air accident that I talked to you about, that the accident was uh, so great that his whole body, the, uh, the surgeons took eight hours to put his body together, it was so badly mutilated. 
Janma Vimshotari Moon Ketu Dasha he died. Now look at Mercury and Ketu. Remember, we need to examine Mercury and Ketu. You can see that Mercury and Ketu are together with Surya. Three of them are together in the 11th house. The Mrityupada is associated over there. Okay. And uh, you can see Ketu is also the uh, 11th Lord out there. And of course, we can examine further, like Mercury is the sixth lord and it is the ninth lord, etc. We are also looking at the house lordship, the Rashi lordships of Mercury and Ketu. And we are also looking at the Bhava lordship of the Graha, which is in Gandhanta. These Gandhanta cases, they, the Grahas were at deep Gandhanta point, almost in 13 degrees, last 30th, 29, 30th degree of a Rashi, you know, so they are deep Gandhanta point. Here it is in the 13th degree. Here the notion of Sandhi comes in, which I will discuss tomorrow. All right, uh, I will take up this chart again and we can discuss it. But you see this interesting thing that this 13th degree, 12 degree, 31, and I think Rajiv Gandhi's fifth lord power jupiter is in that so the gandanta was the death of this guy had to happen for him to get the raja yoga and why is it raja yoga for him because jupiter who is in this 13 degree of magha is the fifth lord of power and position placed in big bala and simha conjoined lagna lord all right it's a lot of raja yogas mercury is also over there but you can see the breakage of bone yoga is there very very powerfully it's an absolutely horrible death. This whole body was broken into pieces. And Ketu, you can see, is very powerful in its own sign. It is also the Badakastana. Ketu is also the Badakesh out here. Okay. So when we look deeper and deeper, we can see more and more connections which are. So Ketu, which is actually uh, the Lord of Magha, Ketu, which is the Janma Nakshatra, it is the Badakesh in Badakastan with Mercury and with Surya over there. And you can see that at that when this happened, because of this Gandanta, his Jupiter in Gandanta triggered off. That is Rajiv Gandhi, the horoscope that we saw a little bit before. You may feel that I'm going a little bit fast, but I just wanted to uh, share these horoscopes with you. Now you can see Indira Gandhi, this is the mother. Now see how tragically the whole family, the mother and the two sons are involved. Indira Gandhi in total has been our prime minister for about 14 years. And before that, she was a defense minister and home minister. She was a statesman from 1966, straight after her father's death, before her father's death, actually. Uh, she was a part of this uh, political process. She was a bond statesman, etc. All these things happened. Now, she also has a bunch of planets, but what are we focusing on? We are going to focus on her seventh lord and Atma Karaka again, Shani, which is in the 27th degree of Aslesha. So it's not in the 29th degree like Mahatma Gandhi. It is about in the 28th degree of Karaka and Aslesha. And you can see Shani is also placement in Lagna is also a Marana Karakstana, right? You can see third lord Dhanu, uh, third lord Rahu is in Mula Nakshatra. So now this seventh lord in this very serious Gandanta actually killed her husband. She lost her husband, Feroz Gandhi, at a very, very young age. And it's after that that she uh, kind of fully went into politics. And she had an 18-year marriage. You can see this Rahu Venus, a debilitated Rahu out here in Mula Nakshatra. Okay, 18 years of marriage. It is conjoined Venus. And uh, I think her husband died in uh, Jupiter Mercury itself. And she lost her son in Saturn Venus, Sanjay Gandhi from the air crash. And she herself was assassinated in Saturn Rahu. So you can see this Saturn actually caused the death of her son and caused her own assassination. So her assassination was also very sudden. She was in her own house and her two security guards turned her down and shot her down. They were Sikhs and this was in retaliation to, you know, an operation that he had undertaken in the Golden Temple, which is the main, uh, you know, the religious uh, place for uh, these followers of Sikh religion. And it was a considered a very, very major uh, sacrilege what was done. So they, the Sikh community got back and they killed her. But if you can see that in Saturn Venus, uh, her son died out of the car crash, uh, sorry, the aircraft crash, and she herself was assassinated in Saturn Rahu. And Rahu itself is there in Mula Nakshatra conjoined Shukra. 
All right, about Mercury and Ketu. Ketu is nature in the 12th house and Mercury you can see is in the 5th house of Sun. So either Mercury and Ketu you will see uh, will create a problem. So here it is the seventh Lord. So, the, so she lost her husband and then in, she lost her son and then she herself uh, had a very, very bad uh, death. So I want to rush through because there's one last horoscope uh, that I wish to do. And it's uh, about your new monarch of England, His Majesty the King, Charles III. Now, the most uh, uh, interesting thing which the world recognizes about uh, King Charles is that he has been the longest serving heir apparent, not just in British history, but I think in the world history. So he became the heir apparent when he was three years old in 1952. In 1952, his grandfather, George VI, passed away and immediately his mother, Queen Elizabeth II, was proclaimed to be queen. So the moment she was proclaimed to be queen, he became the heir apparent. All right. So from age three, he waited because his mother had an exceptionally long reign of 70 years. So he... Uh, was heir apparent for 70 years and he just was proclaimed king uh, about a you know, month ago on 8 September uh, this year, 2022. So from 1952 to 2022, 70 years, all right, uh, he was in the waiting. He has many grahas in the uh, these uh, six Gandhata nakshatras, if we are to uh, sit and examine them. But I will take your, draw your attention to the 10th Lord Mangal. The 10th Lord Mangal, which is also the Amatya Karaka, because Amatya Karaka grahas are responsible for directing you to your profession. This Mangal is in the fifth house of power and position, which is wonderful. It is Swashetra in its own sign, which is again wonderful. But this is in the 28th degree of Jeshta. All right. Now, one more additional point. Jeshta, the Devata for Jeshta is Indra. The Devatas of Nakshatras are really the most important because Devatas represent light. They are from the word Divu and they are the ones who infuse Nakshatras with light. And it is that light which is actually giving us the light and life and longevity, the prana for us. So Devatas in ancient Vedic times, they actually only refer to Nakshatras by the names of the Devatas. They wouldn't say Jeshta, they would say Indra. You know, because Indra is the Devata for that. Indra means the throne, all right? The power, the position, the throne. So that throne escaped him in the 28th degree. Otherwise, you would say how wonderful the 10th Lord Mangal and Amatya Karaka in 5th house of power in position in Swashetra. Unfortunate fact of that. Now, um, so he could only get it, only... Uh, after going through all the tribulations, after his mother passed away, which was much, much more uh, a long time. And that's when, you know, this is the whole waiting period. People thought that he would never be king because since he was already 73 and, you know, uh, Queen Elizabeth was going great guns. She actually only deteriorated suddenly in the last few months. I believe two days before her death, she was, you know, driving her Range Rover and entertaining her cousins in Scotland in a castle. So she suddenly, you know, kind of deteriorated in a couple of months after she got COVID and she suddenly expired. But they thought that, you know, otherwise, God knows she may go on to live beyond 100. She was healthy. And maybe this boy, man would never be king. So meaning that's an end of a career, isn't it? Even now he has got the throne at the 73rd year, which means that even if he had a very, very long life, and we pray that he has a long life, I mean, how um, able would he be? Uh, would he be like his mother and not let old age hit him? Uh, would he, or, you know, maybe old age might hit him after 10 years. So practically his son would have to step in. Do you think that's what's going to happen? So it's actually very, very interesting over here. Now you can see that the fifth Lord, Mars is also the fifth Lord, and that shows children. So he has a very problematic relation with both his children. People are talking only about his relationship with the younger son, but both his children, there is a problem. Where his elder son and, and his heir apparent, Prince William, is concerned, the relationship got mended because Prince William's wife, 
the Duchess of Cambridge, that is Catherine, she played a very, very major role in actually bridging the gap between Prince William and Charles. So they are kind of, you know, okay now and they're work, you know, they are working together. But where the younger son was concerned, it was a severe long, long time ago. And I believe much, much before even his marriage to uh, Meghan. So uh, this relationship is very troubled. Uh, they are, you know, he is saying very damaging things about the king. And there is a, a threat that a book may come out, which may be even more damaging. So you can see fifth Lord child and more importantly, the 10th Lord. Now, you can also see that the third Lord Rahu is in Ashwini. So there is a problematic, very problematic relationship with his younger brother, which is the Duke of York, Prince Andrew. And now this uh, prince, this Duke of York, this brother, has also had a finish in his life because he had to give up his all his royal duties and his you know, royal titles because of certain sex scandals that he was involved with. So his mother did that, but this is showing up in his chart. And then the seventh Lord Shani is in Magha, which shows a very problematic, complex first marriage. That marriage was so complex uh, that, uh, you know, it really gave him a lot of bad name and, uh, you know, uh, problem, a, a nasty divorce. And then eventually a sudden death uh, for the seventh Lord, that is the former Princess of Wales, Diana. And uh, even ninth Lord Jupiter is in Mula. So you can see so many planets out there. Take a quick look at Mercury and Ketu. Remember, this was also there in a previous horoscope. We saw Sun, Mercury, Ketu combination, right? We saw it, I think, in Sanjay Gandhi's chart. He also has Sun, Mercury, Ketu combination. And look at this, Ketu in Maranakarak, Mercury in Maranakarak, Sun in Dikshunna and debilitated. This combination in his Arura is not good. So his Arura has not been very good. I personally feel that, you know, he will make a very, very uh, good king. And, uh, but his Arura is totally smashed. And uh, you can see that both the uh, luminaries, sun and moon, both the luminaries are in the Shunya. So they are very important grahas for a monarch. So Surya debilitated, Mercury and Ketu are in Maranakarak Sthana, and they're all together over there. So he had to literally give up his career. You know, the career was practically given up and until, uh, you know, uh, this happened and his mother eventually passed away and he became the king. And, um, and again, as I said, ninth Lord, I think he became uh, king in Jupiter right now. He is running that Dasha. Jupiter is the ninth Lord. All right. So the ninth Lord is a very, very important Graha. So we can go look much, much more deeply into it. But you can see that we have seen uh, grahas placed in different degrees of the Gandanta nakshatra. You have seen, of course, in the deep Gandanta points, you have seen the grahas uh, also placed, you know, in the middle of the bhavas, you know, they are Purna nakshatras. You can say that what is the remedy for this Mercury and uh, Ketu? Mercury carries the Sattva of Vishnu. So whenever Mercury is problematic, we advise worship of Vishnu over there. Whereas Ketu is a headless graha. So for Ketu, we advise the worship of uh, headless deities like you can either worship Ganesh or all the Veda Murtis because the Veda Murtis don't have heads. So any of the Veda Murtis, including Ganesha, can be worshipped for Ketu and Mercury is all endowed with Sattva Graha. So we can worship Mercury to increase that Sattva of Mercury out here. And as I said, as we can see, we can really go much, much more into these horoscopes, but maybe we will draw them out when we talk about it tomorrow, because we are now going to look at all junctures of the nakshatras, not just Gandanta point. What if there are there is a, a juncture of a nakshatra in between a Rashi or a Bhava? That is a Sandhi. So we're going to look at all those junctions tomorrow uh, in the talk on Nakshatra Sandhi and uh, would try to, uh, you know, if you have queries to answer now and maybe take up some of the points, explore them further as well. So, uh, uh, so over to you, Paul. And uh, thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak for the uh, Leeds Theolo Theological Society. Thank you, Sabani. Uh, can you hear? I've, yeah. un I've unmuted myself. Um, are there any questions for? Thank you very much indeed. So it's quite detailed, and uh, going to need a 
So now I have to listen to this again to get the uh, full power of the uh, words that you've been speaking. So um, but it was excellent. And um, I have to say, uh, I don't feel that Charles is particularly popular in this country. Um, I mean, it's, uh, Queen Elizabeth kept her political views to himself, whereas, of course, Charles has been very outspoken, which now that is the king. I mean, it's um, he said he's, he's going to uh, not be so outspoken, um, but already there's demands on him that he not speaks at a forthcoming environmental conference. And yeah, again, again, did, yes, yeah, they, yeah. the prime minister has told him not to go. Here, I've circled his Arura Lagna. That has that Ketu Mercury sun out there. Yeah. Um, I mean, he, he isn't that popular at all. You know, I mean, his, his, his position is, is respected, but him as a person, um, I don't yeah. think he's respected at all. It's very different to uh, his mother. So and yeah, we'll have to wait and uh, see what what uh, happens. So, um, are there? I think someone said, is Moon a problem if placed in the fourth padder, say in Bulla, and how to manage it? Yes, uh, the when we talk about Moon being in Gandanta, as I told you that uh, <clears throat> the longevity and life then comes into question. And then, of course, you will need to see uh, the actual Gandanta degree points that I mentioned to you earlier in the talk, because Moon, when it is in exactly those Gandanta, those are points given by Parashara, then really there is a threat to uh, life and danger. But yes, if Moon is there in these nakshatras itself, so I mentioned to you that I spoke on Chandra Gandanta last year. There I have actually gone through uh, the effect of Chandra in the different padas of these nakshatras. Uh, those details are given over there. And I did not want to replicate what I had spoken earlier. So you, you, know, you can listen to that. And there I've gone through the padas. What happens when Chandra Gandanta is there in different padas of these nakshatras? Yes. Well, as I mentioned earlier, I mean, that was a question from Vijay uh, in India. Um, my son has his moon at uh, 29 degrees, 50 minutes, uh, Jayester, and um, he split from his, and the moon is the fourth lord, so he fell out with his mother, and he's never, you know, about nearly eight, ten years ago, and he's never spoken since, and that precipitated him moving home, because he moved it with me, and he's still lives with me so it was a life changing he was very devoted to his mother but you know there was a split and it, it meant that he had to physically relocate you know he had to leave home his then home and come back here his real home you know so there was, it was a very powerful change a very big change in his life um moving on christine has said uh, can you talk a bit more if the ascendant is in is in the gandanta hmm. See, when you are talking about an ascendant being in Gandanta, then you're talking, we are, you're talking about the Lagna degree out here. But basically, that comes more into the concept of a Sandhi. That is, uh, 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 the Lagna itself is at a border. So that means that Sandhi will create a lot of instability in your life. But we are here talking about grahas in the nakshatras. So when grahas are in the nakshatras, they are going to create either death or death-like or calamities or problems in your life, sometimes from past life itself, sometimes from this life, in different aspects, depending on their bhava lordship. So uh, we are looking at the uh, placement of grahas in nakshatra. Nakshatra Gandanta is actually, that is the topic what we are talking about. But when you are talking about bhavas, if that means uh, bhava itself, is it towards a very, uh, either the first degrees of a sign or a last degrees, I myself have, like my bhava lagna is towards the, uh, you know, the last degrees of a sign. And what happens in the, it affects the bhava chalit chakra. So the whole bhava chalit chakra changes. You know, mm -hmm. so uh, there could be a lot more disjunction between what you are and what you think. So that actually is away from the topic that what I'm discussing now. So that is not Nakshatra Gandanta. Here we are talking about Nakshatra Gandantas and uh, Grahas which are placed over there. Yes, if you say that I have my Lagna in a in kind of a, that kind of a degree and it is in Mula, so will that affect? Well, not unless there is a Lagna over there. 
all right lagna nakshatra the ascendant nakshatras are also important because it dominates the way you think but moment of grahas over there is when the real stories begin okay. and we have had a, <coughs> an anonymous question how does rahu fructify <coughs> excuse me how does rahu fructify in gandanta nakshatra yeah, Rahu does, of course, fructify in Gandanta Nakshatra. Uh, we have uh, Rahu in many of the horoscopes. We saw that Rahu was in a Gandanta thing. In this horoscope itself, uh, exactly what you did mention about uh, uh, the king, uh, you would see that he has a bunch of grahas in the Nakshatra, na Gandanta Nakshatras. Right. He has, of course, Mangal, as I told you, in Jeshta. Then he has Rahu in Ashwini. He has Shani in Magha. He has Moon in uh, na Ashwini again. And he has uh, Jupiter in Mula. So, so many Grahas over there. That is what exactly you're talking about. Is that is and look all that mercury ketu and debilitated sun in his arura lagna so that is the entire bad i mean definitely what his mother uh, 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 enjoyed he doesn't enjoy i mean it's from all different angles from his marriage to his son to everything so huge product I mean, I focused a little bit on the Mangal because that was a very prominent one and that we all know, so it showed up. But all this, so you very well know all the details being in uh, in the UK, but you can see that so many Grahas in these uh, Gandanta nakshatras and that lord of these nakshatras, Mercury and Ketu, are both in Maranakarak Sthana in the fourth house and in his Arura Lagna. That is his Arura, what we talked about. I'm not being popular, no? huge amount of issues. So, I mean, I didn't go in through all the details, but yes, it's all there. It's interesting that he's uh, um, Zeruda Lagna and his son, of course, is aspected by Rahu and Saturn, and um, they're both um, lords of Aquarius, which yeah. um, I take to be the Lagna of the World Economic Forum mm -hmm. organization. And... Uh, he is very deeply involved with the WEF, which again is very problematic. Um, so that's where the influence comes from. It's, it's going to be real problems for him. Um, okay, so uh, Christine says thank you very much for answering her earlier question. Are there any more questions for Sarbani? Sarbani, I just wanted to say thank you so very much. Um, I really love that you um, commented about that you went in about that it's not just that those last degree and first degree points it's in the actual nakshatras and it kind of hit home for me i have a lot going on in Aslasia and maga and um i just feel like you nailed it it was just really terrific because even though i have planets that are not in that exact gandanta point certainly there have been a lot of stresses related to that just based upon the nakshatras so I, I so agree. Thank you so much. Yeah, and you should look up uh, lordship of those uh, grahas and you should look up where how Mercury and Ketu is in your horoscope when you do your own analysis. And it'll give you a little bit of a more clearer picture. Yes, and I'm in Mercury Ketu Dasha. So <laughs> there we go. Yes. <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. So um, I think there's one more question. Let me just see. Um, What's uh, from Jonathan? What is the effect of grahas in Gandanta in Vargas, a D10, for example? And he also says, Thank you for your amazing presentation. So, the effect of grahas in Gandanta in uh, the divisional charts. So, you know, divisional charts, Jonathan, and uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, we, I actually don't think there are degrees over there because, you know, when the uh, the main, the Rashi is constructed, that is the actual mapping, you know, it's an astronomical thing when we are born on a certain time, there are star positions and graha positions, and we calculate them, and we actually get the degrees which we plot in the Rashi chart or the D1 horoscope. Now, all the Vargas are kind of microscopic, uh, a spatial representation. We are taking a microscopic slice by dividing each of the bhavas, and we are creating these 
projected microscopic slices of different areas of your life. They are not actually out there in that sense. So to say that there can be degrees uh, in the Varga charts, no. So uh, we don't look into degrees of the Varga charts. But if you want to see the status of those grahas, you can definitely look up, which I was doing a little bit looking up and seeing, oh, okay, the mercury is bad. See, the mercury is bad in the as well. You can see that how those grahas are placed uh, across the vargas because the real weightage of the uh, positive, positive or negative weight of that graha would really be judged from the uh, how it is across the vargas. You can also look up into Vimshu Pakavala, which is given by Parashara, just to judge the strength of a graha across the vargas. So similarly, if I took, say, for example, if I took uh, Mars uh, in uh, uh, King Charles's uh, horoscope, then maybe I, if I would be interested to see how is Mars and uh, all the uh, other Vargas. So the placements may be very good because the placement is very good in its own sign here and it's in Soshetra. Till I look into the degrees and till I look at Ketu, Mercury, Sun and get a completely different picture. So yes, we don't look at uh, uh, degrees in Vargas because there are no degrees in Vargas. The degrees are all mapped into the D1 horoscope. Yep. You wonder, I think we have a last question from uh, VJ um, in India. If the planet in Gandanta is the Atma Karika, does mm. the view of Gandanta change? No, we just did it for a couple of horoscopes. We did it for Mahatma Gandhi's chart as well as Indira Gandhi's chart. Here, Indira Gandhi's chart, she also has a couple of few planets here and there in Gandanta Nakshatra, but we really took her. She took Saturn, which is a Raja Yoga Graha for her. It is an Atma Karaka. So it's a very complex Graha. Uh, Shani is in Marana Karak Sthana in Lagna. But it is Atma Karaka in Lagna and in Sign Cancer, which is a Raja Yoga combination. And that Raja Yoga comes, the Parivartana comes, moment her husband dies, really the real change in her comes. Shani is the seventh lord. You can see that is a Parivartana. That change occurs. And we saw yeah. that this Shani is in a Slesha Nakshatra. So Atma Karaka means it's that much more um, poignant, it is uh, that much more uh, loaded uh, uh, in our Prarabdha karmas, that much more heavy for us. Look at uh, Mahatma Gandhi, Chandra was his, I think, Atma Karaka, wasn't it, if I'm not mistaken? Somebody's, somebody else's horoscope we did had. Uh, yes, Atma Karaka, even in the case of Mahatma Gandhi, Chandra was Atma Karaka. Okay. Um... Thank you. I think uh, people are saying thank you so much for an excellent class. Uh, okay. Energy, so thank you very thank much. You. I think thank we'll. Shall I stop people. sharing? Yes. And um, let me just see if we can uh, stop the uh, stop recording. <laughs>